declare his glory why not the earth we have a responsibility to exalt the name of God and we who love Jesus are given to praise tell somebody praise is just what I do yeah praise is what I do I speak well of God I I join in his praise and to God be the glory for the gift of praise. I thought about the psalmist that wrote the song, I will bless the Lord and, and bless his holy name. Why? Because he has done great things. One psalmist says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name. Isn't it wonderful to be on a roll with praisers and people that are given to praise? You just feel better. You just feel better. Hallelujah. Listen, listen. There is something the Lord wants to do in this place, and it requires an element of contrition, not just joy, but brokenness. Um, Sometimes it's our own flesh that gets in the way of what God is at work doing. Housed in the flesh, the flesh is a carnal way of thinking that disconnects us from God. Not what God wants to do, but what God has already prepared and planned, purpose to do. God has taken his rest in the earth. God's not getting ready to do something. God's already done something about everything. You see, this is what makes the praise... Um, more exuberant. It makes the praise more authentic. We don't just praise God for what we sense or feel he's about to do. We praise God because it's already, it's already done. And, and, and so sometimes church and worship is an opportunity for you to bring your praise out of prison. Life's vicissitudes and cares and anxieties and worry well, apprehend your praise. Put the brakes on what God is pushing you towards. But just as it is in the medical community, when there is an emergency, man has the understanding
to put sirens on an ambulance. And when you hear the noise, it means get out of the... And for everybody that's on their way somewhere where in life, and it's of necessity that you get there, God has built within you a siren. Are y'all hearing me today? And when you know you're on your way somewhere and you got to get there, you got to raise the level of your noise. Oh, magnify him with me. This is why the Bible says, make what kind of noise? A joyful. There is a sound God expects to hear when he has given you a destination, a place to go, a promise, a commitment to you. And can I tell you, desire doesn't get you to destination. Direction does. Did you hear what I just said? You end up where you end up because of the direction you take. And could it be God will call you to worship and give you direction? Praise me. Raise the level of noise. In all of the midst of uncertainty, fear, confusion, just give me praise. I want you to lift your hands. Praise to God is where I make my boast in him. I bring the element of imagination and possibility to my praise. Hey, thank you, God. Thank you, God. My soul now becomes the vehicle that my spirit dictates to. Mind, will, intellect, emotions, and imagination. And, and I choose to listen to my spirit that tells me, take my rest in God. Declare the battle is already won. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. This is the victory that we have even our faith let your soul say so there's a different sound for people who know they are victorious yeah. no, no, no. there's a different sound for people who know not hoping to be thanks be unto God who always giveth us the victory people who know they are victorious tell somebody I got evidence and I got confidence. Tell somebody else, I know who I am. And my name, my name is Victory. My name. That's somebody's testimony. God, God's already declaring to you, you coming out of this battle. I've already run the race for you. Declare victory now. I say declare victory now. Victory ought to look good on you. It ought, to, it ought to sound differently. Hallelujah. Tell me who can stand before us when we call on thy It's not a call for help. It's a praise call. We have, not will have. One more time. I want to know. Tell me who can stand me for us when we call. Come on, uh, uh, didn't he not do it for you? Precious. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Precious, precious. Oh, Jesus. Come on, his name is in a term of endearment to us. Precious, Je one more time. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. Hey, victory every time you call it. Come on, we have the victory. We have the victory. We have the victory. Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We have the victory. 
Father, for the next few moments, speak to us unequivocally that it is you talking. Anoint us afresh for the assignments given to our lives. Surely you didn't bring us this far to leave us. You speak to us in such a way that we know your voice, my Father. We know your voice. Mm. Uh, break up your fallow ground. We know your voice. It's time to seek the Lord till he rains righteousness upon you. We know your voice. A stranger we will not follow. Incline your ears to our prayers. Let your spirit hover over us now. Oh, show us the error of our ways and bring us unto the path of life. Let the words of our mouth always be acceptable in your sight. We hold fast this confession of faith. For you have begun a good work in us. And you shall perform it until the day of Jesus. And we give you praise for it. We give you honor for it. We give you all the glory. For it is thine. And the church everywhere said amen. Tell somebody, neighbor, God is not through blessing you. Anybody waiting on a miracle in the room, you need a miracle. It's not everybody, but somebody need God to do something. I want you to exercise your faith right now and shout, it's already done. Oh, hey, God, I thank you. It's already It's already done. God's not through blessing you. I say God's not through blessing you. And remember, he blesses you because he wants to. You don't have to earn or merit a blessing from God. It's because you are chosen. Yeah, you're chosen. Grace is what he's now free to do for you because of Jesus Christ. That's why at the mentioning of his name, you go crazy in your praise at the mentioning of his name you throw up your hands all the glory all the honor belongs to him he's the king of kings the the lord of lords he took back the keys of death hell in the grave and he has made provision for us and we give him praise you may take your seat if you have a bible i want to encourage you to follow me in this journey of faith as we examine God's word closely for an intent. Say with me, an intent. Uh, you better be intentional in this season with your faith. If not, you will have what is called a faith failure. And I'm going to talk to you for the next few moments about how to avoid a faith failure. How to avoid a faith failure. This is a word for somebody specifically. When God speaks to me like this directly, I know uh, he is at work in the lives of his believers performing what he has already willed to do. The Bible says, work out your soul's salvation, right? That salvation is complete in Jesus, but through time, God uses the construct of time to manifest what he has already willed. But God introduces to us through Jesus this principle, this, this discipline we must pay attention to. Luke 22, verse 31 and 32. Luke 22, 31 and 32. Luke 22, 31 through 32, it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desire to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. I need everybody to pay attention to what I'm getting ready to say. The nerve of the devil to have a conversation with God and ask to sift the beloved of God as wheat. What gives Satan the gall to make a request? Well, there's an MO to the enemy that I got to help you understand this context. The Bible says he's an accuser of the brethren. 
So what the enemy does is he looks for weaknesses in our lives, gaps. He looks for our shortcomings, and he's ever before the Father trying to accuse us of not being worthy of what God has purposed and prepared. He's trying to, in some way, convince God to give up on what he has promised to do in the life of the believer. It's just in his nature to accuse. He's an accuser of the brethren. Are you with me? And he knows the legitimacy of sin or leaven, that it actually disqualifies us from God's blessing. A little leaven like doubt can disqualify you from promise. And so he looks for where we give display to anxiety, to fear, to doubt, and he takes this evidence to God. As such, God, I know you don't like sin. God, I know you hate to be doubted, but look at Sally. Look at Sue. Look at John. Look at Jerry. Look at their doubt. Let me have him. Can you see? To sift him as we, God uses this language through Jesus to get Peter to understand uh, agriculturally what men did to wheat in the sifting of it. And then he says, but I prayed for you. God has already done something about everything. Even when you know you are spiraling down, you are unraveling. I need you to know this afternoon, God has already prayed for you. Are you hearing me today? I'm trying to catch somebody before you hit rock bottom. You are spiraling, but lift your head up. Be of good cheer. God has already done something about the spiral. The enemy has increased his warfare against you. But look what Jesus says. He's prayed. I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. I didn't pray that God would block what the enemy wants to do. I'm going to pray that your faith fail not. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. First John 5. And this is the victory that we have in God, even our, there is no victory without faith. God is not going to exempt us from any battles that are necessary to produce greater faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please not without going to church, without. All of these things are important, but if going to church doesn't increase our faith, we miss the mark even when we go to church. If you're showing up here for any other reason than to be developed in your faith, you are missing the mark. Wouldn't it be a tragedy that your going to church actually was recorded as sin to you? that your intent was wrong, God judged the motive and it didn't measure up to that which brings him glory and all sin is falling short of the, the glory of God. Are you hearing me today? What does Jesus pray for? Your faith doesn't fail you. Why? Because without faith it's impossible to please the God. Not without singing, not without dancing, not without rejoicing. All of that has its place. But what God looks for most is what? All these other things ought to be an offspring, and a, 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 a result of our, our faith. And then he goes on to say, now when you are converted, which means you ain't converted now, Satan got something to work with, and he going to work on you, buddy. You, you got it? Strengthen your brother. Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 5, turn there. Mark chapter 5. How to avoid a faith failure. Let's look at the concept of faith. So we understand how this law of faith works. How to avoid a faith failure, a misappropriation, an abuse or misuse of this law called faith. Mark chapter 5 verse 25 says, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years, all right, and suffered many things of many physicians. That means they put her through the ringer trying to get her healed. 
And she spent all that she had. So she's suffering and spending. Say with me, suffering and spending. And the Bible says, and was nothing better. She didn't get better. But he didn't stop there. But she grew worse. Imagining being abused, taken advantage of, don't get better, but actually get worse. The harder she tried to get healed, the worse it got. And when she heard of Jesus, faith comes by. All right. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind. So she heard, faith came, she got in the press. You got it? She came in the press to do what? Touch his garment. Where did this come from? It says, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, I love Mark's language, the fountain of her blood was dried up. So faith comes by hearing, but faith is released by speaking. She heard and she spoke the law of faith. I heard about Jesus, his capability, his covenant with his people. And she said, nobody told her to say, might I add. There was no preacher giving her a prescriptive confession. Her own faith inspired her confession. She said where? Let me show you how she used her faith. She used her faith to plant the seed, the word where? In herself. She said to her, it's amazing sometimes we come to church and we be talking to everybody else but ourselves. We trying to impress everybody else that we got faith, but we really don't believe it ourselves. It would be like a preacher trying to preach about faith to impress you, but don't really believe what they're preaching themselves. The woman sowed the seed of the word of faith, might I add, in her own heart. And watch this. Look what happens. Straightway. Straightway is not often used in Scripture. Jesus met a woman at the well and straightway she became an evangelist. Hey, glory to God. This woman spoke, press, and straightway. You got it? The Bible says, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague and Jesus immediately anointing himself that virtue had gone out, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, and no doubt it was Peter trying to be smart, you see all these people throwing in thee, and you got nerve to say, who touched you? He looked around fearing, but the, and he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what she had done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. How she had suffered, things got worse, at her wit's end, and she heard about Jesus. Hey, thank you, God. She heard about his capacity to heal. Heard about his love for people that he went around doing good, healing all of those of, of disease, casting out devils and healing. She heard about Jesus and she said to herself, if I could but just touch. And he said unto her, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Daughter, here it is, church, the law of faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Live in the experience of what your faith just created. Too many of us are backsliding. We've come this far by faith and we can't go no further. We've come this far by faith but somewhere along the way we started to doubt. Thy faith has made thee whole. So there's some aspects of faith that God has called us to walk in. The dynamics of faith 
when understood, can cause us to accurately function biblically according to God's will, according to God's plan. I've established through talking to God that the second half of the year is going to be greater than the first half. Amen. Yeah. To every person that will understand the faith process and the development of their faith. It's going to be an increase in our productivity. The prophetic word is that from the secret place, you and I are going to partake in provisions, protection, and prosperity. Come on, let's just say it. Provisions, protection, and prosperity. Tell somebody, I don't know what that means to you, but I know what it means to me. Provisions, protection, and prosperity. Yeah, God knows how to protect what he started in you. The revelation of the secret place, a place where there's unwavering faith, unwavering trust, where you and God stand firm in what cannot fail. Uh, it, it's from this platform of being committed to what God has promised, what God has said, that you and I are going to experience greater communion, greater confidence, greater conviction in our everyday life. Communion, confidence, and conviction. You got it? Communion, confidence, and conviction. Communion, confidence, and conviction. Faith is the foundation, though, of this secret place where there's communion, confidence, and conviction. The story in the text of this woman with the issue of blood, Jesus credits this woman's faith for the results that she received. She didn't give up on the faith process. She didn't let the fear of being found out that she's in this crowd illegitimately stop her from what she believed. There are some spiritual facts about the faith process. 2 Timothy 3 and 16 tells us, according to this law of faith, if faith comes by hearing the word of God, then we got to start there. That all scripture, all word, is given by the inspiration of God, and it is profitable. Everybody know what profitable means? All right. It's profitable for doctrine. That is the established order of God in your life. Doctrine. Not just what you teach the dogma about Scripture, line upon line, precept on precept. Because I know a whole lot of people who know church doctrine, but there is no doctrine in your life. There is no established order of God in your life. In your help, in your finances, in your career, in the things that have been given concerning your responsibility, no doctrine. You got it? It's profitable, he says, for reproof. You know what reproof is? The dismantling of error. All of us have some error in our lives that the Word of God is sent to us for reproof. Dismantling of error. Then he says correction. You know what correction is? It's the assimilation of truth. So God reproves before he corrects. I need you to hear me. I'm going to dismantle error, and then I'm going to add to you. I'm going to dismantle error, and then I'm going to add truth to your life. You get it? God ain't in the business of mixing. There are no mixed drinks in the kingdom. He don't mix doubt with faith until you're willing to what? Unlearn. Until you're willing to confront your own self. There is no new additions to your life. He don't put new wine in old skin. That's how Jesus was said to those in his day. I'm not mixing nothing. Some of us have been in church for so long until we forgot that there's some things we got to unlearn. There's some strongholds that need to be pulled down. There's some stuff we believe that has exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Like telling yourself, I ain't going to be healed. Or telling yourself, I just got to live with that. Or telling yourself, this is just the way it is. Or telling yourself, that's just who I am. 
or I got to accept this, or I can't have this, or I'm too old, or I'm too young. The devil is alive. How are you going to consent to believe something that the Word of God doesn't undergird? The grass withereth, the flower faded, but the Word shall stand forever. He says it's profitable for instruction in righteousness. Hallelujah. Bringing your whole life into divine alignment that the path you take is called righteous. Watch this. How many of you believe you're on the righteous path? You believe you're on the righteous path? Like, mercy, mercy. Okay, raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Okay, you didn't know. All right, that scared me. Mercy. All right. <laughs> like 20% of y'all raise your hand. Altar call now, right now. <laughs> All right, but I get it. I said believe. You know how you can close the gap between what is and, and where you believe? It's hearing the Word of God. It's hearing the Word of God. The path of righteousness is not one you create. It's the one God gives you. It's the one God puts you on. And so if you're not on that path, there's some element to your daily regiment where you're resisting what God is trying to do. You don't go look for the path. You don't try to create the path. The psalmist says, you shall show me the path of life. Glory to God. Are you hearing me today? That's what repentance is in the New Testament. It's called the grace of repentance. You don't really repent until God shows you a better way. You don't turn from what you're currently doing away from it unless you see something better. And even if you try to turn because of the shame and remorse and you turn away from it, you're going to turn right back to it until God shows you a better way. Even in repentance, God initiates it. He doesn't use worldly sorrow to initiate repentance. Paul says it's godly sorrow that worketh repentance. So that means even in your sorrow, even in your remorse, God got to be in it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because see, that's one thing for the law to convict you. You know, you violate the Ten Commandments, you know, and that convict. It's another thing when the Holy Spirit shows up and convicts you. He brings a tight contrition and remorse that'll just be you and God. He'll show you the error of how you think and how you act and how you behave. It, and you immediately go into contrition. And many times it'll be tears of sorrow. Am I talking to anybody in the room? Yeah, it'll be a godly conviction where it'll almost feel like a depression, a heaviness. He'll let you feel how he feels concerning sin. How just a little doubt is leavened to him and how he's so holy, sin can't stand in his presence and he'll let you feel it. And if you, if you go with him in the journey, he'll then show you something better. Glory to God. So you don't even have a desire to look back. Are you with me? I need to talk to some people that don't come out of something. Right, when you really come out, you don't desire to go back. I'm kind of skeptical of you Christians that's always looking back like, boy, y'all show sure having fun out there. Ooh, if I wasn't saved, I'd be in that club with y'all. Ooh, if I wasn't saved, ooh, roll me up. You know I can't do it. I got to teach Sunday school tomorrow. Oh, I'm scared of that. I'm scared of that conversion that's law-based, that the conviction is produced by the old covenant law. Are you hearing me? No, no, no. This, this work is a work of grace. All things new is inspired by the Holy Spirit. New convictions, new way of thinking, new way of talking. Are you with me? Not religion, the Spirit of God. If any man be in Christ, he's a and so now the new man takes to the Word of God, and he births out what the Bible says, a perfect man, a man complete. Look what the Scripture says, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. Sometimes you've got to get in the Word of God and let that Word reprove you. It's like a checkup from the neck up. 
Do you hear me today? So the Bible says Jesus credits their faith to their victory, to, to, to her healing in this case. And so the confidence that I have in the faith process will always be to the degree that I understand how faith works. Watch this. Ask someone, and don't worry about answering. Ask someone to the right or to the left of you, do you know how faith works? Now that's the question for you to go home and think about. Can I answer the question biblically how faith works? Because most of us were raised in religion. We're taught just believe God. Baby, put your trust in God. God going to work it out. Jesus can't work it out. <laughs> and and you, you listen to song, just, you know, turn it over to the Lord. He worked it out. And like, forget about it, baby. You done turn it over to God. You know, and then for other of us, we, we've been taught to treat God like he a genie in a bottle. You know, just rub it, make a wish, tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line. Oh, Jesus on the main line. And then we have an image of Jesus being up there on an old Bell South telephone. Waiting on you to call and make your order. Or put something on layaway. That's the kind of images we create. When we haven't been taught properly the faith process. You get it? It ain't hard for God to work on your behalf called the faith process the results in my life is dependent upon faith development this is why there's no season of your life you can afford to waste where you're not growing in faith development sometimes God stacks the deck against you to develop your faith hey glory to God he actually hardens the enemy's heart he actually allows you to experience betrayal. He'll let some people who start out with you betray you. To do what? For you to develop your faith. Faith is like a muscle. Ain't no development without more weight, without more opposition. Come on now. Come on, man. You that elementary, you don't know how the faith process works? It's okay to say yes. Matthews 9 27 through 29, the Bible says, When Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying, saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? He didn't say, Go get me Peter, James, and John. We're going to lock arms. We're going to pray. Did he? He's explaining the faith process. Right? To blind men. Because they came to him. Okay? Now, now, if you're going to ask God to do something for you, you at least got to know how faith works. You got it? Lord, heal me. You at least got to know how faith works. So what I'm telling you moving forward in your life, don't ask for nothing in faith without getting this lesson I'm giving you, without understanding how faith works. Because I can always tell when you don't fully understand how faith works, I'll preach a message to you on faith, give you the steps, and you'll come right up to me after church and say, oh, I need you to pray a special prayer over me. I'm getting ready. I'm saying, now, I done preached on faith, did the altar call, touch you, and you still need, like, special prayer. What is said in the Bible? Special prayer. Watch this. For what you need from God through faith. For what you believe is already yours, you just need to access it through faith. For what you believe is the children's bread, your entitlement that you can simply get through what you need. Now, I'm not trying to discredit special prayer, right? It'll, it'll make sense if you said, I need special prayer because I'm special. Like, I'm mama's hard-headed child and I really don't have it, so when you pray, pray for me because my mind is double-minded. Well, I'm going to leave this church and I'm going to be back doubting again. Now I understand the special prayer is not for the miracle. You need deliverance. 
because what faith requires, if faith comes by hearing and faith is released by speaking, then we got to pray that you hold fast the confession of your So if we say, boom, we done prayed, it's done, we believe, then I need you to hold that on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, on Saturday, on Sunday again. You got it? So, so if, if you need deliverance, it's almost like the man when he came to Jesus and Jesus said, you believe? He said, yeah, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Are you hearing me today? They came to Jesus and Jesus, he says to them, do you believe I'm able to do this? Do you believe I'm able to do this? That's the first thing. He that cometh to the Father must first believe. Do you believe I'm able to do this? That's a soul check. That's, that's a self-confrontational question. I got to check myself because I can't lie to him. Because what he's telling them is, what's about to happen next? It's going to be based on what you believe. I know I got the power to do it, but that ain't going to determine if you receive it. Do you believe I can do this? Come on, I need to talk to some folks that got some faith goals now. Do you believe I can do this? Hey, hallelujah. What did they say? They said unto him, yeah, Lord. And the Bible says, then he touched their eyes. Saying, this is empowered, this, this important happy preacher. That's your new nickname, happy preacher. <laughs> Be it unto you according to your faith. And immediately they saw He just touched their eyes. His hand became the conduit to what their faith was supposed to reveal. You know what faith is? Faith is having the title deed for that which you have no sense realm evidence you're believing for exists. Faith is not waiting to get it. Faith says, I already got it. So he says, okay, bid unto you according to your faith. Are you hearing me today, church? So the results, say with me, the results in my life are dependent upon my faith development. This is why you can't waste the Sunday, you can't waste the Bible study, you can't waste the devotion. If it doesn't lead to greater faith, you're missing the mark. You're falling short of the glory of God. And some of us, we've been coming to church too long to yet have so much doubt concerning what God already has promised to do. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, you can't please God without faith. Galatians 3 and 13 says, the promises of God are received by faith. Romans 10 and 17 says, faith starts where the will of God is revealed. So there's no such thing as arbitrary faith. You can't just have faith for what you want to have faith for. Faith, the God kind of faith, is revealed where the will of God is manifested. Meaning, once I know this is God's will, I start exercising my faith. Are you hearing me today? So let me give you an analogy how faith works in the concept of the kingdom. Faith is called a law. I preached a message on the laws of the kingdom. One of those laws is the law of faith, all right? So there are some fixed laws in the natural. How many of you have heard of the law of gravity? Right? And, and you, are, you are so aware of the law of gravity that you're not willing to take a shortcut, meaning if you climb a ladder and get to the top of your roof and you don't feel like climbing down, you just jump off. You're so aware of the law of gravity, of the adverse consequences. Even if you pray and say, Lord, I want you to suspend me in the air and let me down easy. You don't even trust that, do you? Because you know the law of gravity is a law God put in place. Are you hearing me today? But faith is like what we call the law of lift. The law of what? The law of lift. Newton's laws of motion. Let me give you this. The law of gravity is around us at all times. It's in effect until a higher law is put against that law. And the higher law than the law of gravity is called the law of lift. When the law of lift comes into effect, 
Are you with me? It suspends the law of gravity. The law of lift doesn't nullify gravity. It simply causes us to rise above it. Newton's three physical laws. One, a body remains at rest or in motion at a constant speed in a straight line, except insofar as it is acted upon by a force. It's like a plane, right? Goes in a straight line. A force is creating pressure on the top of that wing. But Newton's law says you can divert that air and create opposition against the pressure that's coming against that wing. Where that wing can have a diverter, where it'll flip down, come put pressure on the, on the airplane by bringing air downward. Are you hearing me today? Pressure on top, pressure down. It creates what is called the law of lift. Part two of Newton's law says, at any instance of time, the net force on a body is equal to the body's acceleration, multiplied by its mass, or equivalently, the rate at which the body's momentum is changing with time. If the two bodies exert forces on each other, these forces have the same magnitude, watch this, but the opposite direction. Newton's third law, lift is generated as the wings deflect the air downwards. It has to create the air by going fast. But Newton's law say if you deflect the air going downwards, you're going to get the equivalent of lift, resulting in the equal and opposite reaction. This lifts the aircraft upward. The two laws in the Bible that are contrasted in Roman is called the law of sin and death and the law of the spirit and life. God doesn't nullify the law of sin and death for the wages of sin is still what? So the law of death, sin still pulls you down. But God says if you enact another law, are y'all hearing me today? That law is still there, but if at any time you decide to enact another law, faith can be activated intentionally like the law of lift. Are you hearing me today? The realm of the spirit is where faith works. It's where God exists. Watch this, where angels exist, where Satan exists, where demons exist. Man, man, men and women are what? They are spiritual beings with spirit realm access. The world was framed by words. Faith comes by and hearing the words. The world is formed by words. God saw opposition. The world was dark and without form and the spirit hovered over, but the spirit couldn't do nothing until a word was spoken. Jesus declared that his words are spirit and life. The spirit man, watch this, the spirit man is born again by the catalyst of our words. Romans 10 and 9, if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. The spirit man is born by the catalyst of your words. Hey, glory to God. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be, for with the mouth confession is made, but with the heart man believe it. Are you hearing me today? Words. So when the Bible says, hold fast the words of your confession without wavering, he's faithful that what? That promised this. Faith in its simplest form is acting on the word of God walking in obedience to the written word and the rhema word of God. Faith enriches our lives. Are you hearing me today? Yes, there's a benefit when you walk by faith, the faith process. It starts with a plan of action. God sends a word and then he gives you a plan. Then you expect favor, are you with me, to undergird this plan. Then you expect wisdom. 
God's going to give you some uncommon wisdom, not the wisdom of the world, but uncommon wisdom. And then number four, you expect a miracle because the two laws are going to collide. Are you hearing me today? And then there is something called strength to endure because faith, if it's from God, has to be tested. And so you got to endure so your faith don't fail. And then the examination of the faith process, when you, when you know you're in faith but you want to examine like, am I really in faith? Is this really going to work? Am I really going to see the manifestation of God? There, 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 there are five things I want you to examine. Number one, your ask. Examine your ask. Am I asking this to consume it upon my lust? Or am I asking for what I believe is already the will of God that I have or experience? That's the A of the examination. Then there's the B. When I ask, I got to believe, John 20 and 24. I've got to believe. So I got to ask myself, am I truly believing? The C is the confession. Am I confessing properly what I believe the will of God is? Not asking, because that's the A. I got to now confess. So when I ask, I got to then confess what I believe I've asked for I confess now that I already have it. You got it? And then no four is demonstrate. That's the D, A, B, C, D, E. That's where I'm going. You demonstrate that faith. In the context of our story, this woman says, if I could touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. She demonstrated what she believed. She went for it. She walked towards it. It's demonstration. Some of us are missing the demonstration of what we say we believe. We're missing the demonstration of what we say we're confessing. And here's the E, endurance. Hold fast. Endurance. We don't build into the plan endurance. We don't keep saying it. We don't keep believing. We don't keep confessing. We don't keep demonstrating. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Demonstrating. Ah, the supernatural life is a result of asking, believing, confessing, demonstrating, and enduring. I'm closing here. This lifestyle of faith equips us for successful encounters against satanic opposition, overcoming setback, equips us for living victorious. The definition of supernatural faith and its results, y'all ready for this? It is the extraordinary miraculous interventions of God and it's the influence of righteous principles into earth's affairs. Uh, the lifestyle of faith, the supernatural, the extraordinary miraculous interventions of God and the influence of righteous principles into earth's affairs. Through the intervention ah uh, Though it's not always spectacular how God intervenes, they are supernatural because of their divine origin. Divine origin? Yeah. Extraordinary interventions, three of them. Number one, revelation. When God is walk, causing you to walk by faith, he'll give you revelation that he didn't give nobody else. Revelation is required for supernatural living. Number two, relationship. Relationship is required for supernatural living. This is why when you are really up against opposition, you really call to this next move of God in your life that requires faith, sometimes you've got to lighten your load. There are some folks you've got to dismiss for a season who are not in that level of faith. Psalms 1 is the requirements and the merit for the relationship. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the, of the un, sit in the seat of the scornful, standeth in the way of sin. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And he shall be like a tree. Planet. You got it? That's relationship requirement for the supernatural. And number three, the resolve. The resolve required for the supernatural is found in 1 Corinthians 15. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the... 
Hebrews 10 and 23, hold fast the profession of your faith without. So we got revelation, we got relationship, and we got resolve. Ah, glory to God. Are you hearing me today? Then there's some documentation for supernatural faith. Documentation for supernatural faith. Mark 2, 1 through 12 talks about the story of four men bringing their friend to Jesus. Documentation of supernatural faith. They got revelation that Jesus will heal our friend if we exercise our faith and get our friend to Jesus. Because he's lame, can't talk, can't help himself. They had relationship. We ain't going to listen to folks tell us, don't y'all do that. Don't y'all get on top of that roof, tear a hole in another man's roof. Don't y'all interrupt Jesus while he in there teaching. No, they had what? Relationship with the word. And then they had a resolve. I'm not going to give up. It takes faith to please God, and we believe God will answer based upon our demonstration of faith. Then there's this phenomenon of a divine appointment. I close with a prophetic word. The Lord said to me late last night before I went to bed, he says, Mark, tell the church there's a divine appointment. Second half of this year, everyone under the sound of your voice and those that are watching me online, there will be a divine appointment from me. What do you mean, God? A divine appointment to bring deliverance to your generation. Look at somebody and tell them, you're getting ready to have a divine appointment by God to bring deliverance to your generation. When God made it clear to me, Mark, that he had called me, he made it clear you're going to have an impact on your family, on the church, and everyone I bring you in contact with. Let me give you some examples of divine appointment. Moses. Moses thought he was putting out a fire in a burning bush, but it was a divine appointment. Samuel thought he was just attempting to get clarity concerning God's voice from Eli, but it was a divine appointment. David was just taking supplies to his brothers, and he had a divine appointment. Gideon was just trying to feed his family, and the angel showed up. Gideon, mighty man of valor, divine appointment. The little boy who brought his lunch out to hear Jesus teach the multitude of the people didn't know that his lunch Jesus was going to use to feed 5,000 plus with 12 baskets left, divine appointment. The woman at the well was just going to get water, but it was a divine appointment. The four lepers was just trying to survive, but it was a divine appointment that Jesus passed by. Perhaps you were just coming to church, but it was a divine appointment. God has a destination for you to make you an instrument of hope, aspiration, revelation to your family. Hey, thank you, Jesus. To your friends and ultimately to the world. I need you to believe that you're on a journey and it can't be church as usual, can't be worship as usual, can't be Bible study as usual. Say with me, divine appointment. And I'm closing with this. When God speaks to you, young people, he doesn't have time to convince you that he's telling the truth. When I speak, I need you immediately in the faith process. Hey, glory to God. When I tell you, what I'm going to do, I need you to be looking to me for a plan. Expecting favor. Expecting wisdom. Expecting a miracle. And expect to endure. Because something's going to come. It might get worse before it gets better. Expect to endure. And then when you get weak, don't have a faith failure. Go check the ask. You ask this according to my will. Go check your believing. You still believe in my power? You believe I can do this? Check your confession. Are you saying what I want you to say every single day? Go check your demonstration. When the last time you moved in faith? 
You did. You sold what I told you to sow. You got up and went to that altar when I told you to go to that altar. It didn't happen the first time, but I told you, keep coming back. Glory to God. You went and did what I told you to do that looked illogical, didn't make sense, but you demonstrated you believed I was going to do it. And then check your endurance. You still happy with me, though I got you waiting? You still rejoicing, believing it's already done? You still testifying that it's already worked out? That I've already done something about everything in your life? The results of your life will be to the degree the development of your faith. Will you stand to your feet? I'll let you go. Before I do that, I want you to consider all of the possibilities that exist in God and all of the calamities that could exist when you have an ounce of doubt. There's no room for doubt. Doubt is leaven. God said the divine appointment. And for some of us, he's going to come back and reaffirm what he's already said to us. But I'm like John the Baptist now, forerunner. I'm giving you foreknowledge of what's to come. Get ready. There's another move of God in your life that's greater than anything you've imagined. Hey, glory to God. And you can't afford to have a faith failure now. Lift your hands. Father, our hands are raised. Whatever is in our life that is causing doubt, whatever thing that has been exalted against the knowledge of Jesus Christ, we cast it down now. Bring that to our remembrance. As we take examination, ah, uh, my Father, of our understanding and development of the faith process, uh, where we walked in doubt and unbelief, will you forgive us? Blot out our transgressions. Thank you, Jesus. We believe you have prayed for us that we don't have a faith failure. And we declare today we will not. We will be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, Father, open the eyes of our understanding. Let every veil be lifted in this room concerning the assignment that is before every believer in this room. Whether it's in their career, in their finances, in their health, in their relationships, in their desires, hey, for relationships in their ministry, their assignment to make a difference in the world, let every veil be lifted. Where we have marginalized ourselves and locked ourselves out of your best, lift the veil. Lift the veil. Hey. Open the eyes of our understanding that we might know what is the exceeding greatness, the glory that exists in the inheritance of the saints, that we might know. Hey. Thank you, Jesus. Now fill us with your spirit. Come on, tell him, Lord, fill me with your spirit. You need a measure of the spirit in this season for what you're up against. You need a measure of the spirit in this season so you can flow. Flow in the things of God. Feel me, Lord. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Till there's a flow. Faith is a flow. Hey. I want to be flowing every day, talking in faith, making my boasts, bragging, declaring victory. A flow. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We declare the victory in this place. We declare victory in you. We examine ourselves. We exercise our faith. We say, God, we will walk by for the rest of our lives that you might be glorified in all things. And it's in Jesus' name, Father, we make this declaration. And the church said, Amen. Clap your hands and give God some praise. Come on, the Lord's praise. <coughs> Come on, the Lord's praise. Come on, the Lord's praise. Hallelujah. Come on, the Lord's praise. Hallelujah. All right. I got to let you go, but if you're here today and you're not a member of any church or you need spiritual coming or you're watching me online, you're here today and you perhaps never accepted Jesus Christ, my team is down here. We would love to pray for you. 
last act of worship is going to be asking you to share a seed and offering. And I want you to be prepared to do that as some of you need to exercise your faith even in your giving today because God will speak to you in the next few seconds about that. God, I thank you. I thank you for the best. I thank you for the best. I thank you for the best that you called me to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you believing? Are you praying? Do you trust God? Yeah. Whoever God is talking to, our team is waiting on. We got Bibles for you. We got material for you. Listen, listen. I wouldn't play. I wouldn't play. I wouldn't play with God in this season. I would be connected to the right spiritual covering. I would want to walk with God. I want to get in small group. I would. I would. I would. Come on. Wow. Come on, y'all. Look at God. Look at God. Hallelujah. What a family. What an incredible family. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. Come on, daughter. I see somebody else coming. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. I give you praise. Listen, I'm going to try to be the best pastor I can be to you, okay? There's a process here where we ask you to take a look at what our church is all about. They're going to take you in the back and get some more information from you. I do ask you to hold me accountable as a pastor, right, to the role I play in you. If you hold me accountable, I'll hold you accountable, and we're going to grow up together. Is that all right? Come on, show your love for some incredible people that are coming to partner in the thing God has called us to. And whatever you have need of to grow spiritually, we're going to try to provide it for you. Our team's going to take you in the back, get some more information from you. Everybody get an offering in your hands so we can go quickly. Hallelujah. Quickly, quickly, exercise your faith. Let God push you towards purpose in every area of your life. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for our hearts to give from now. We don't just give from our wallet or give from our coffers. We give from our heart. What's from the heart reaches the heart. We want to show our worth your worth to us as vessels of honor. We trust you with the first. We trust you with the first. We trust you with tithe and offerings and as you speak to us special offerings. We we trust you, God, that what leaves our hand doesn't leave our life and that we own nothing. We're simply stewarding it. And our seed is the only voice our future has to obey. So we sow not as a debt we owe, but as a seed that has authorization to speak for us. Uh, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Give us understanding in how we sow and what we sow. Give back to every giver the same way they give into you. Give back even to a thousandfold, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. If you're in agreement, shout amen. Quickly, come on, obey the usher. Bring your gifts. Don't forget, first-time guests, we've got a reception for you right next door. And... Um, love to shake your hand and offer you a gift next door. Generosity. Don't forget, if you got a debit card or credit card, they can swipe it to the right or to the left. You can text to give.
Listen, let me share this with you. This is an election year on many levels, uh, and it's important that we pray for our country, uh, both at the federal level, the state level, the local level. Uh, there are those who have been called to serve in times like these. These are tumultuous times, turbulent times. Evil is multiplying, and uh, it is causing only those who are called to do this to want to do this. And for those who are serving in the political arena, I, I pray for them because it's not an assignment I would desire to do in times like these. But we have some incredible people. One just so happens to be in this city, leading our city. She's a mayor extraordinaire. I want you to give our mayor a rousing round of applause for the work she has done the last two years, two terms rather, and I believe God's not through with her yet. Did y'all hear me? I said, I believe God is not through. Yeah, and, and we're going to see the handiwork of God as he continues that work in her life. We need, must be in prayer. And uh, I'm a little disturbed as well with what I see in the school board uh, and in this outrage against uh, how we are trying to elect the new superintendent for East Baton Rouge Parish. Uh, it, the tragedy is when we elect people to serve and then we don't allow them to serve. I'm publicly against trying to cause kids to stay out of school to demand we get what we want. We ought to have a meeting with people who are leading to ensure the process works first, that we get the best candidate. It's not about preference. When are we going to learn? The manipulation, the same witchcraft we are accused, we accuse others of using on us. We use that same stuff when we don't get what we want. And I'm man enough, anybody got a problem, you can come talk to me. I know evil when I see it. I know the wrong spirit in processes, especially political processes. None of us are perfect. But we ought to commit to a process and let the, the process run its course. Look at the criteria for which we look at. It ain't about preference and who we like. It's about who's the most qualified. Yes, that's God. Justice and righteousness comes from his throne. We get in trouble when we try to manipulate the system. And a small group says we're speaking for all. And that's too much apathy, especially in the African-American community, where we don't get involved to pay attention to what's going on. We just go through the whim and get behind whoever is the loudest voice and don't understand. Call to account. Have a town hall meeting. Call to account and let me understand the criteria how we're selecting what's best for our children, not preference. We've suffered long enough as a people electing a lot of times who we like and what's popular versus who's the most qualified. Hello, somebody. And uh, if you don't know, get back in your word. Get in the word of God. Let the word get in you so we can get out our flesh. The Bible says when the righteous are in charge, the people rejoice. And I pray we be prayerful. We, none of us have all the answers, but be prayerful. Be prayerful because witchcraft is prevalent in Louisiana. It's a spirit. It's a spirit. And spirits hover over regions. Are you with me? spiritual wickedness in high places. They use systems to keep people oppressed. And we are a rich soil. Louisiana has rich soil, raw materials and resources, creativity, ingenuity. For instance, in New Orleans, how it's known for jazz and creativity. But we have not developed that out properly. We have not. The creativity that God has given this part of the world, we don't exploit it. We don't use it for the good of everyone else. We're limited in our thoughts. We lack creativity and ingenuity in coming together. I could go on and on about the different sectors and how we are dead last in so many areas, from infrastructure to education to criminal justice to health care. We can keep going on and on. And yet we have in church jumping and shouting like everything is all right. God forbid. God forbid. Creativity, I look at the raw materials and resources in Louisiana and said, if we ever came together and we didn't care about who would get the credit, and do what's for the good of people and quit pushing politicians into place who are ambitious, get you elected, and then they don't care about their responsibility to the people. 
we would be such a, a more perfect union, an incredible state. And I believe the time is now for us to turn on the light and let our light shine. If you have a voice, let your voice be heard. Let's hold ourselves accountable and those that God had put in place so we go up together. Stand to your feet. i got to let you go. Look at somebody to the right or to the left and tell them, neighbor, God is not through blessing you. Tell them, neighbor, we walk by faith and not by sight. One more profession. Neighbor, I see you in your future and success looks good on you. Tell them I love you and I think you can do about it.